Welcome to this module on how to use CGE models for gender-aware economic analysis. The module is composed of two separate but complementary sessions or capsules. The first session introduces concepts and analytical approaches drawing from a rich body of gender-aware economic literature. It explains why it is important to integrate a gender lens within a CGE framework and shows us how to formulate CGE questions that can help to inform gender-sensitive policies and interventions. The second session uses a hands-on approach to describe the steps needed to build key gender-aware features into a CGE model and carry out a policy impact analysis. The next slide will present the outline of session one in greater detail. Session two is developed in a separate capsule. Before we start, it is important to stress that there is no single or predeterminate way to include a gender lens into CGE models. At the same time, we also need to understand that a gender-aware CGE model cannot be expected to answer all the questions related to the gender dimensions of an economic problem. By successfully engaging with this module, students will be able to achieve three main learning objectives. First, you will be able to explain why a gender lens is important for the design of a CGE model and how CGE models can contribute to gender-aware policy analysis. Second, you'll be able to describe the variety of approaches that can be used to integrate gender features into CGE models. And finally, you will learn how to formulate a gender-aware policy question that can be answered within a CGE framework. The outline of session one is as follows. We will start by explaining why a gender lens is essential for economic analysis in general and for understanding inequality, discrimination, and poverty in particular. We will then discuss how CGE models can be used to support the formulation of gender-sensitive macroeconomic policies. We will then describe several approaches that have been used to integrate gender into macro models in the literature and present a selection of studies with emphasis on the policy questions they have asked and their methodological choices. We will conclude by setting some general principles or guidelines that should be followed when designing a gender aware CGE model. These guidelines relate both to the task of constructing SAM accounts and the task of how to choose model behavioral assumptions. Examining economic data through a gender lens is crucial to understanding inequality and causes of disadvantage because economies are characterized by unequal gender patterns in many dimensions and spheres. Paid work, for instance, is marked by gender segregation and gender earnings gaps in both developing and developed countries and women's labor force participation rates are still lower than men's in most of the world. For example, the chart on the left shows trends in female and male labor force participation rates by region between 1990 and 2013. While in some regions, most notably Latin America, female labor force participation grew and the gender gap narrowed. In other regions, female labor force participation stagnated and in some cases, such as India in South Asia, the gender gap has widened rather than narrowed. The chart on the right is employment status by gender in different regions of the world for the year 2018 and adds precious information to what we learn from the graphic on the left. It captures how many women are in the workforce relative to men. Reporting labor statistics by gender and employment status can tell us also something about the quality of women's and men's jobs. The most striking aspect in this chart relates to the proportion of women and men who are categorized as contributing family workers. Women remain overrepresented in this category in all regions of the world. This employment status is the most vulnerable form of work since it implies no independent access to income or meaningful say in the way the family business is managed. The graphic shows that the gender gap for contributing family work is widest in low-income developing countries, where 43% of women and 17% of men 
were engaged as contributing family workers. Gender inequality is also found within households where primary responsibility for unpaid care work is largely assigned to women. As the graphic on this slide shows, the distribution of unpaid work has not only a gender dimension, but also a poverty dimension. This chart is taken from the latest UN Women's Report on Progress of the World's Women. It shows the average minutes per day spent on unpaid and domestic work by sex and income quintile in selected Latin American countries. The green bars represent women's time, while the blue bars represent men's time. The most interesting insight from this graph is that while the average time men spend on unpaid work remains largely the same across income quintiles, this is not at all the case for women. Women in any quintile spend more time than men on unpaid work, but women in the poorest quintile spend much more time than women in the richest quintile. This is likely explained by the fact that women in the poorest quintile have limited access to household infrastructure, such as piped water and electricity. For policy purposes, it is important to highlight that not all women are involved in unpaid domestic work and care in the same way. It is low-income women who tend to bear the highest burden in terms of both drudgery and time intensity of their work. Sessions in another PEP online course, Gender Analysis and Economic Policy Research, provide further evidence and elaboration of some of these issues, and students are strongly encouraged to consult them. To further our discussion, it is useful to highlight here the main contributions of gender-aware economic analysis. The first contribution is to make unpaid household labour visible. This effectively reshapes the understanding of the conditions necessary for the functioning of the paid economy. The second contribution is to emphasize that gender is a category of social and economic differentiation that influences distribution of income and wealth, productivity of work, and behavior of economic agents. The third insight is that gender often intersects with other sources of disadvantage, such as social status, migration status, ethnicity, and a lack of income. It reminds us that it is therefore important not to treat women and men as homogenous categories. And finally, the fourth important insight is to make us see that macroeconomic outcomes emerge from institutions such as firms, government, households, and markets, all of which carry gender bias. These perspectives in economic thinking are further elaborated in the next few slides. The interdependence between the paid economy and the unpaid economy emphasizes that economies are gendered structures, that they are comprised of both a paid economy, the output of which is counted as contributing to economic growth as measured by the GDP, and an unpaid economy, which supplies services directly concerned with the daily and intergenerational reproduction of people through their care, socialization, and education. As we have already noted, the paid economy and the unpaid economy are characterized by gender inequalities, such as the division of labor in which women have more limited access to paid jobs and occupations compared to men in the labor market, and that women bear a disproportionate responsibility for unpaid care and domestic work. Large businesses are often led by men. As well, households are subject to internal gender inequalities in income, consumption, asset ownership, and decision-making. Unpaid care work is not counted as contributing to economic growth, but it makes an indirect contribution since without this work, there would be no people to produce economic growth. The gender-aware economic analyst must strive to disaggregate her variables not only by sex, but also by age and stage in the life cycle, family circumstances, migration status, disability, race, or caste. One must take into account how gender intersects with other sources of vulnerability to determine terms of inclusion in or exclusion from economic opportunities.
In regards to the observation that macroeconomic policies and economic shocks happen with economies that are characterized by gender bias, the implication of this is that the relationship between gender and the macroeconomy is a two-way relationship. On the one hand, any kind of macroeconomic policy, ranging from taxes to public spending to international trade, inevitably has gender distributional effects. For instance, the diagram in this slide shows that, in relation to trade, some policies can be gender equalizing, while others worsen gender inequality. For a more detailed discussion and concrete examples of these disparities, you are encouraged to take the module on Gender Perspectives on International Trade in PEP, Gender Analysis and Economic Policy Research course. On the other hand, gender inequalities may undermine the achievement of macroeconomic objectives. For instance, gender-intensified constraints in accessing productive assets, such as land, other inputs, and markets, causes productivity gaps between female and male farmers. This gender gap in turn means that the capacity of the agricultural sector to generate greater output in response to better prices and economic incentives remains limited. Now we will move on to discuss how CGE models can contribute to gender-aware analysis. Computable general equilibrium models offer an opportunity for improved analysis of the gender effects of economic policy reforms and shocks. Their strengths are that they explicitly represent the many linkages existing between various markets and sectors and interactions between micro and macro dimensions. Also, they can be highly disaggregated in terms of sectors, production factors, and household groups. Finally, CGE models allow the researcher to capture both demand-side and supply-side mechanisms, and to measure both direct and induced effects of policy interventions. We briefly return to three main objectives of gender-aware economic analysis highlighted in earlier slides. One, an emphasis on the interdependence between paid and unpaid spheres. Two, attention to intersecting disadvantage. And three, the acknowledgement of a two-way relationship between macroeconomic policies and gender inequalities. And now we ask, how can CGE models help? When appropriately disaggregated and designed, CGE models can help with Objective 1 by allowing the representation of a multiplicity of market as well as non-market sectors and carefully describing the nature of their linkages. CGE models can help with Objective 2 by enabling detailed distributional analysis that can illuminate how gender intersects with other sources of vulnerability such as ethnicity, low educational attainment, migration, and or stage in the life cycle in determining different labor market outcomes. Finally, appropriately designed CGE models can also help with Objective 3, because by combining an economy-wide perspective with micro detail, they can trace both effects of gender inequalities on economic performance and effects of economic policies on gender inequalities. We now move on to describe methods of bringing gender into macro models that have been developed in the literature in the last 20 years or so. Two special issues of world development, of which one was published in 1995 and another one five years later, constitute seminal contributions to the field of gender and macroeconomic modeling. By macroeconomic modeling, we mean here a broader field than strictly defined CGE models. The overall analytical framework outlined by the editors in the introduction usefully distinguished three main types of approaches. The gender disaggregation method, the gendered macroeconomic variable method, and the two-sector system method. The gender disaggregation method involves disaggregating macroeconomic variables by gender on the assumption that men and women have different behaviors in terms of investment, consumption, and similar activities. The gendered macroeconomic variable method introduces economic variables that capture the structure of gender relations, 
such as the degree of gender inequality in labor markets. An example of this is the CGE model on gender and technological change in Mozambican agriculture, which is reviewed in the next slides. The two-sector system method represents the economy in terms of two spheres, one of which comprises traditional economic market variables, while the other represents the unpaid reproductive care economy. The two special issues illustrate various examples of these methods and recommend combining two or more methods together as the best approach. Fontana and Wood, a range of contributions by researchers and collaborators at the University of Laval, and a series of overlapping generational models developed by Aganor and Canuto are examples of applications that combine more than one method. A list of applications is provided in your references. Only selected aspects of some of these contributions are summarized in the rest of this session. Before proceeding further in the presentation, it is important to offer a note of caution. The most obvious and easy way of introducing gender into a CGE model is to disaggregate some of its variables by sex. This would correspond to method one in the previous slide. This approach, however, is of little value if used on its own since it does not put into question any of the basic assumptions of the model. In other words, it is important that the constraints and rigidities that face women more than men when involved in economic activities must be reflected in the design of model equations, not just through data disaggregations. For example, the researcher may introduce separate female and male labor factors in its SAM accounts. However, if the model equations themselves are not formulated through a gender analytical lens, this exercise risks turning into a mere mechanical exercise in which gender becomes simply a label for calculating shares and reporting results. Model equations and associated parameters, in this case, would need to be changed to represent the reality of the labor market in which both supply side and labor side factors affect different groups of female and male workers differently. Similarly, there are cases in which the researcher might develop a micro simulation model that differentiates household members by skill and gender. But the core CGE model to which the micro simulation model is linked does not have any gender categories. This severely limits the analysis and might even lead to misleading results. We now move on to show how to ask gender-relevant questions that can be examined through a CGE framework. First, we present selected examples of questions that have been asked in existing gender-aware CGE applications. Then we outline the key steps required to formulate meaningful and policy-relevant gender CGE questions. Since the late 1990s, a number of computable general equilibrium models have examined gender effects of macroeconomic policies. The extent to which these CGE models integrate gender as an analytical category varies, as does the range of policy questions they explore. Existing computable gender general equilibrium models, from now on CGGE, have been mostly applied to trade analysis such as in the models of Coburn and Fofana, and Siddiqui and Fontana, all of which are listed in your references. A model of Mozambique by Arndt and Tarp deals with gender and technological change in agriculture. These models mostly involve comparative statics exercises. Their questions include, one, what is the differential impact of tariff liberalization or other price shocks on women's and men's employment status and wages? What's the impact on women's and men's use of time in both paid and unpaid work? Two, do the effects of trade liberalization vary depending on the rigidity of gender roles in markets and households? Does the impact vary by skill or household group? Three, how does technological change affect gender divisions of labor across different crops? What's the impact on women's productivity and remuneration in agriculture? What's the impact on these gender differences in labor allocation on overall output? 
In the last decade or so, a new generation of CGE models has started to engage with current policy debate on gender equality, for example, those related to the Sustainable Development Goals. One important dimension of these debates regards the importance of care provision and the need to promote policies to reduce and redistribute the burden of unpaid work and improve well-being for all in both the Global South and the Global North. Public investment in both social and physical infrastructure is a key intervention for achieving this goal. For further details on these policy issues, you are encouraged to consult the relevant modules in the Gender Analysis and Economic Policy Research course. These are more recent economy-wide modeling efforts, not strictly conventional CGE models. They innovatively combine elements of input-output analysis, micro-simulations, and overlapping generations OLG, approaches. They usually have dynamic components and consider longer time horizons. These models usually try to provide a better representation of the way unpaid household work interacts with public and market provision of care services. Their questions include, how does public spending on care services compare relative to public spending on construction in terms of job generation in general and employment distribution by gender in particular? What are the respective effects on gender wage gaps and poverty reduction? How different kinds of spending cuts, for example, cuts to education spending and or cuts to health spending, affect women in different socioeconomic groups and family structures? What are the long-term effects of gender-responsive public investment on gender equality, productivity, and economic growth? Can these public investments generate sufficient tax revenue and hence ensure fiscal sustainability in the long term? Even more recently, in the past year or so, a few CGE models have started to be used to ask questions regarding the distributional effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Even though only very few of these new applications include gender consideration for now, this demonstrates, once again, that when adequately designed, CGE models can be powerful instruments to inform gender-aware policymaking. Gender-aware CGE models can be helpful in examining the economic shocks associated with COVID-19 in the following two ways. One way involves the ability of CGE models to trace the compound employment effects of the economic shock that combines direct indirect and induced employment effects. This would enable the modeler to ask, which specific groups of women and men are likely to be disproportionately affected by COVID-related job losses? What will be the poverty impact across different household groups? The other way relates to the ability of CGE models to enable simulations of alternative scenarios regarding fiscal and sectoral policy measures to be implemented in response to the COVID-19 crisis. This type of exercise is very important because it can help researchers and policymakers to identify which policy options are more likely to reduce gender gaps and hence promote a gender equitable and sustainable economic recovery. To conclude this part of the presentation, the sort of questions that can be asked with a gender-aware CGE model vary, and there is not a single way of answering them. However, there is a number of steps that always needs to be carefully taken in order to design a CGE model for meaningful gender-aware policy simulations. First, it is important to carry out detailed data analysis through a gender lens with a view to understand the key features of an economy as a gendered structure and identify main gender-based bottlenecks. What sort of policy interventions might be helpful in addressing them? For example, is women's paid employment mostly concentrated in manufacturing? Are female intensive sectors also export intensive sectors? Or is it that women are mostly working in subsistence agriculture and the causes of their low productivity has to do with limited access to assets 
and infrastructure in rural areas? Or similar such questions. Several, mod several modules in the Gender Aware Economic Analysis online course offer good insights on how to investigate these issues. Once the evidence is gathered, the next steps involve using the statistical picture of the economy as a gendered structure to decide how to disaggregate SAM accounts and, in parallel, identify policy questions and modeling approaches. It is important to allow for a number of iterations, carrying out further data analysis and stakeholder consultations to test the validity of model assumptions and refine simulations. It is also important not to neglect gender-relevant dimensions that are difficult to include into a CGE framework and strive to conduct additional studies that can enhance CGE results. Now we're going to present principles for disaggregating SAM accounts by gender and will later follow by discussing how to choose corresponding model behavioral assumptions. The first step in building a gender-aware SAM must involve taking some time to understand the gender structure of an economy. This is because policy simulations need to respond to specific structural conditions and gender configurations, which are likely to vary by country. It might be useful to identify a taxonomy of countries based on gender characteristics of the labor market and stage of development to help prioritize policies depending on a country's socioeconomic context. Such taxonomy usually includes the following four categories. One, low-income agriculture-based economies, LIAEs. Two, industrializing export-oriented economies, IEOEs. Three, dualistic middle-income economies, BMIEs further divided into MENA region and LAC region, and four, high-income economies, HIEs. Low-income agricultural economies are countries found largely in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of South Asia. Women's work in these regions is concentrated in the agricultural sector. Most of this agricultural work is informal, with women participating in production mostly as contributing family workers. In sub-Saharan Africa, women's labor force participation rates are overall high and gender gaps in labor force participation usually smaller than in other regions. Gender gaps in vulnerable employment remain significant, however. Physical infrastructure and social infrastructure are patchy and limited in both regions, particularly in remote rural areas, and there is heavy reliance on traditional family provisioning of care which is highly gendered. Social protection coverage tends to be low. The industrializing export-oriented economies loosely denotes low, middle, and middle-income countries, mostly relying on export-oriented industrial development strategies. Many of them are in Southeast Asia, but there is a considerable variation in terms of income level, geographical location, and gender norms within this group. For example, Malaysia and Thailand have higher income levels, more diversified economies with a larger services sector, and more developed social infrastructure and social protection systems than Vietnam, Cambodia, or China. In these latter countries, a significant share of women's employment continues to be in agriculture. High female labor force participation rates tend to be high by global standards, but gender-based wage inequality is pronounced. Greater export orientation may have led over time to female employment shifting away from agriculture towards garments or even electronics, but it seems to have no positive effect on occupational segregation. In the more advanced countries of the IEOEs group, public provisioning investments in education and health have considerably expanded in response to population aging and the push for greater gender equality at work and at home. Care services, however, are largely privately provided, do not always offer decent work opportunities for women, and can only be afforded by relatively well-off women.
a number of countries in Latin America and in the MENA, Middle East and Northern Africa region, could be described as dualistic middle-income economies characterized by high income inequality, relatively low levels of female labor force participation, and significant gender gaps in a number of labor market indicators. These characteristics are often exacerbated in these countries that depend on natural resources and rely on mineral rents. This dualism is reflected in a labor market that is often defined by a small formal sector with high wages and good working conditions and benefits, which coexists with a large informal sector characterized by insecurity, low wages, and limited opportunities for upward mobility. Formal wage work in the public sector is the preferred form of employment for many educated women. Poorly paid domestic services and agricultural work are main sources of employment for low-income women. In both regions, female unemployment rates tend to be higher than male rates, and this is a particularly difficult problem for young women. However, these two regions differ in important respects. LAC women's participation rates are higher than in MENA countries and have been consistently increasing in the last few decades. On the other hand, in many MENA countries, female labor force participation has stagnated at very low levels. Many economies in the LAC region are richer and more diversified than economies in the MENA region. Finally, high-income economies, HIEs, are characterized by high female labor force participation rates and a prevalence of women in wage and salaried employment. Service sectors are the largest source of employment for both women and men, though there is an extensive gender segregation within services, with women's jobs concentrated in education, health, and social care, reflecting patterns found in other parts of the world. Because of significant variation within high-income economies in their approach to care provisioning and social welfare, the literature usually further distinguishes three groups. Liberal countries, which rely largely on market provisioning of social welfare with a limited role of the state, for example, United States and the United Kingdom. Conservative corporatist countries, where the welfare state is well developed, but access to benefits tend to be conditional on employment status and class position, for example, Southern Europe, and social democratic countries, which are characterized by strong welfare states and universal coverage and widespread public provision of services for children, the elderly, and disabled people, for example, Scandinavian countries. The care provision regime in the latter group, the Scandinavian model, is the most effective at enabling high rates of female labor force participation, wage equality, and gender equitable labor market outcomes more broadly. Bronstein, E. 2015, Economic Growth and Social Reproduction, Gender Inequality as Cause and Consequence, UN Women Discussion Paper No. 5, New York. United Nations. For an example of why all of this matters for the construction of a SAM, you may wish to read an early study by Fontana, who built two gender-aware SAMs for Bangladesh and Zambia. Her analysis clearly demonstrates that same trade liberalization policies have different gender effects in the two countries because of their different socioeconomic structure and in particular because of their different gender employment composition by sector. To summarize, the main point of this slide is that decisions on how to disaggregate a SAM must be guided by an understanding of two core gender features in an economy. One regards the gender characteristics of production and employment, and the other regards the way care provision is organized between institutions and by gender. Following from the previous slide, this matrix, taken from a recent ILO policy brief, illustrates a range of policy questions that are tailored to economies which fall under one of the gender country typologies described earlier. This matrix is only suggestive and simply highlights where specific measures are more urgent and or feasible. 
There's no need to go into detail of this matrix, but the policies listed here could be a useful source of suggestions at the stage of deciding on CGE simulations in a particular economy. For more details, you are invited to consult the original source. By providing inputs into the different roles of women and men in the generation and distribution of income and other resources, SAMS can allow a better understanding of the gender effects of economic policy. To achieve this objective, SAMS can be extended in two ways. One is by building internal satellite accounts, and the other is by building external satellite accounts. We start with internal satellite accounts. Building internal satellite accounts involves providing a greater level of detail on gender patterns within existing SAM accounts. Disaggregating existing SAM accounts by gender should include, at a minimum, labor factors, production sectors, and representative households. Most existing CGGEs disaggregate labor factors not only by gender but also by skill usually proxied by education levels. Some models also disaggregate labor by other context-relevant categories, such as race, ethnicity in South Africa, or immigration status. For example, in their analysis of the effects of free trade agreements in rural Dominican Republic, Filipski et al. not only distinguished between Dominican and Haitian immigrant rural women and men, but also by whether they are hired agricultural labor or unpaid subsistence farmers, a categorization with likely gender significance in agricultural-based economies. As for market production activities, these need to be disaggregated to highlight female-intensive sectors. As for agricultural-based economies, the Mozambique model of Arndt and Tarp distinguishes eight different agricultural activities they find that female labor inputs are heavily concentrated in cassava production, while male labor inputs are more evenly distributed across crops. As for countries with other economic structures, garments is typically a female-intensive sector within manufacturing, and this is highlighted in models of Bangladesh, Pakistan, and South Africa, among others. Services sectors, which are predominantly female, are health, education, and social services, but few CGGEs provide a detailed gender breakdown of services. This omission probably reflects the prevailing country and policy focus of most existing CGGE analysis, which is a goods trade liberalization in low-income countries. A disaggregation of activities accounts highlighting services that can either complement or substitute for unpaid care and are known to be major employers of women would be a useful ingredient of a care-focused gender-aware SAM. An example of this is provided in slide 27 describing a SAM recently built for South Korea. Finally, the choice of representative households. A good practice in constructing household accounts in SAMs is to choose types of representative households in a way that express inequalities in living standards arising from differences in ownership of factors of production, for example, households whose main source of income is labor versus households deriving income mostly from capital and other rent and consumption expenditures. In some existing CGGEs, however, Disaggregating household accounts by gender takes only the form of distinguishing between female-headed and male-headed households. This is taken by some authors as the main way to capture gender effects in policy impact. Other models are more nuanced and disaggregate households, not just by sex of the household head, but also place of residence, employment status of the head, ethnicity, and income quintiles. Distinguishing representative households by the sex of the head of the household is useful only if there is sound evidence that female-headed households have fewer resource endowments and rely on different sources of income than corresponding male-headed ones. For example, more reliance on home-based self-employment of the low-productivity kind. However, in most countries, 
female-headed households are a heterogeneous group, often comprised of single mothers as well as widows, a few couples with or without children, and different income levels. Moreover, as pointed out in feminist literature, most notably by Sylvia Chant, the exclusive emphasis on households headed by women risks to neglect the plight of those disadvantaged women who live in male-headed households, and these are usually a larger share of the female population. Distinguishing representative households by number of dependents and care needs, such as presence of children below the age of five, or households with only elderly members, is a more helpful approach to exposing gender-relevant dimensions than simply differentiating by headship. Distinguishing representative households by differential access to basic infrastructure, such as electricity or water, can also be relevant in some settings. Many typologies of representative households are possible, and the right configuration will depend, as always, on a country's specific economic structure and gender dynamics. Just for illustration, the table in this slide describes the household typology using a micro-simulation model constructed by the United Kingdom Women's Budget Group to study the gender effects of spending cuts during austerity following the 2008 financial crisis. Table 1 includes the following gendered household categories. Working age, adults and couples with or without children. Single female and single male adults without children. Working age, female and male lone parents retired couples, and retired single females and single males. Their findings show that female loan parents and female loan pensioners have been the most negatively affected by austerity policies in the United Kingdom due to unfavorable changes in the tax and benefit system for the former group and cuts in health and social care spending for the latter group. Having discussed internal satellite accounts, we now move on to external satellite accounts. Building external satellite accounts in a SAM is a crucial step for being able to accurately represent interactions between the paid market economy and the unpaid non-market economy. These extensions, involve, these extensions involve broadening definitions of what constitutes production or assets. Examples Examples of external satellite accounts are those that use data from time use surveys in combination with other gender statistics to provide a valuation of a household's own domestic work and care activities. This valuation should be estimated for each household member in a particular household group and ideally should differentiate by tasks such as food preparation, child care, and or water collection. The next slide provides a visualization of steps involving both internal and external satellite accounts in the construction of a SAM for South Korea. In a recent study of the gender effects of child and elderly care in the Republic of Korea, Martin Kikiewicz and Hans Lofgren build a gender-aware SAM in which they both disaggregate existing accounts and create new accounts. In a first step, a simple SAM was constructed in the conventional way by using Korea's supply and use tables combined with data on government finances, taxes, and the balance of payments. This SAM was called SAM0. Then, gender features were built in. In SAM1, workers were disaggregated by gender, educational level, and the regularity of employment for example, permanent versus casual. Moreover, separate market sectors were created for childcare, elder care, and services substituted for housework. At a later stage, SAM 2 is built. In it, households are split into three types, working households with children, working households without children, as well as households composed of retired people only. Time used for childcare, elder care, housework, and leisure are added for each type of household and worker. In a further step, market sectors not related to the paid care sectors were aggregated to keep the dimension of the SAM smaller 
in the modeling exercise more tractable. It is useful to note that the Korea SAM is an example of what can be achieved when good quality gender statistics and other data are easily available. In cases where the availability of relevant data is limited, the researchers may have to opt for a more simplified SAM structure. This must be done, however, without losing sight of the core gender characteristics of the economy under study. Gender disaggregation of SAM accounts and SAM extensions must be accompanied by careful model design. This is needed in order to ensure that the behavioral equations of the model adequately reflect the underlying causes of the unequal gender patterns observed in the data. For example, if employment data show that women in a certain country are overrepresented in poorly paid sectors and occupations, care must be put in choosing the mechanism that most plausibly explains such a pattern. Is this largely due to widespread stratification in labor markets and employers' bargaining power over workers? Or is it a lack of public resources to support women in their caring roles? Is it due to women's lower formal education? or a combination of these reasons. How are wages going to be determined in the model, and what is the underpinning explanation for gender wage gaps? What about possible changes to the gender and skill composition of the labor force in future periods? What determines them? In order to help with these sorts of questions, the last part of this session concludes by describing first options that have been used for modeling gender inequalities in labor market behavior, and later, options used for modeling the unpaid economy in its interaction with the paid economy. In existing gender-aware CGEs, gender segmentation in the labor market is usually modeled by using a CES, constant elasticity of substitution production function, that treats female and male labor as imperfect substitutes. To reflect the rigidity of gender roles, some models, such as the one by Fontana and Wood, set female-male substitution elasticities to lower levels than is usual in other CGE models, to 0.5 in market sectors, and even lower in non-market sectors, to 0.25. Most existing gender-aware CGEs that simulate trade policies focus on labor sectoral reallocations that women workers gain if they are disproportionately employed in the export sector that expands, and vice versa. In other words, their results are driven by the initial sectoral gender composition of labor combined with limited substitutability between female and male labor. None of the existing gender-aware CGE models includes gender-based constraints to labor mobility across sectors, except for the one by Arndt and Tarp, 2000. Their model describes women's crowding in cassava production and simulates technological innovation in Mozambican agriculture. The authors interpret the high concentration of female farmers in cassava production as the result of women having primary responsibility for feeding their families and limited access to productive inputs. Because they cannot take risks, Mozambican women opt for cassava production for its properties as a famine reserve crop and basic food staple in home consumption. To reflect these dynamics, Arndt and Tarp's model adds an endogenous variable representing a risk premium to the equations for cassava production and set it greater than one in the base case. This premium results in more female labor inputs being allocated to production than profit maximization would require, and it also results in lower returns to female labor in the cassava production sector. In those gender-aware CGEs that include representation of unpaid care work alongside market work, an important implication for the modeling of the labor market is that labor supply of both female and male workers becomes endogenous. Significantly, market participation decisions involve a choice not just between paid work and leisure, as conventionally assumed in other models, but between paid work, unpaid care work, and leisure.
Women are more constrained than men in responding to labor market opportunities because of their gender-specific obligation to carry the bulk of unpaid care work. In an interesting application to Uruguay, Ines Terra and colleagues introduced the modeling of unemployment alongside endogenous labor market participation decisions, which vary by skill and gender. This brief review is limited to the main approaches to modeling gender differences in the labor market that have been used in existing studies so far. But there is also the need to experiment more and to improve on these specifications in future gender modeling work. The next slides reviews options for modeling the unpaid economy alongside the paid economy. These include early approaches, overlapping generation models, and finally, demand-side studies on investing in care. The first CGE model, including representation of unpaid care activities, in addition to sex aggregation of factors in households, was constructed by Fontana and Wood. It was later applied by Fontana to analyze the gender effects of trade policies in Bangladesh and Zambia. Their approach involved estimating a housework sector and a leisure or non-work sector for each household type. The two non-market sectors are modeled differently in that unpaid housework is treated in the household demand function as a necessity, while leisure is a residual dimension. These two non-market sectors were constructed to behave like market sectors in some ways, but to also differ from them in important ways. In particular, the demand for, and so the supply of, unpaid care work is less responsive to changes in its price than is the case for market goods because these services are essential. This is captured by setting a low value for the price elasticity of demand for care in the Linear Expenditure System, LES, Household Consumption Function. The Household Consumption Function is extended to include not only market goods and services, but also unpaid non-market care, as well as leisure. In addition, the greater rigidity of the gender division of labor in unpaid care work than in market sectors is captured by setting a lower elasticity of substitution between female and male labor in the production of unpaid care. Members of each type of household are assumed to produce particular kinds of unpaid care which is not traded among households but consumed by the members of that household group only. Unpaid care in the household is assumed to be produced by only labor time and provided overwhelmingly by women. It is consumed by the family as a whole without a clear distinction over whether some family members benefit more than others from it. An implication of this treatment is that labor supply of both female and male workers becomes endogenous in the model. Importantly, market participation decisions involve a choice not just between paid work and leisure, as conventionally assumed in other models, but between paid work, unpaid care work, and leisure. Women are more constrained than men in responding to labor market opportunities because of their gender-specific obligation to carry the bulk of unpaid care work. There will be different aspects to contend with with another country, so not all of the approach may be applicable. The Fontana and Wood approach might differ with regards to computational procedures or different disaggregation of sectors, factors, and households, but the overall methodology and assumptions would remain similar. This integration of unpaid household work and leisure allows emphasis on a range of trade-offs that are neglected in conventional CGE models and illustrate that the gender effects of trade can have different results for different groups of women and men. For example, in a model by Fontana, the expansion of garment exports in Bangladesh leads to an increase in both market participation and wages of women with primary and secondary education but also to a decline in their time for both care and leisure. Although time for unpaid care and leisure declines on the aggregate, differences between rich and poor households are also exposed. Women with the same educational level increase their total workload, market work combined with housework, 
in poor households, but enjoy a moderate rise in non-work time in rich households. These insights can be useful for the design of policies, but a more explicit representation of the mechanisms that are at play in these interactions is desirable. One of the main limitations of this early CGGE modeling approach is that unpaid care work is treated as a homogeneous activity without differentiating between tasks fulfilling different needs that are carried out using different technologies, such as cleaning the house versus helping an elderly parent to bed. Each component of unpaid care requires public support through a different mix of policy interventions. In order to analyze targeted measures to reduce and redistribute unpaid care, it would be important to disaggregate these components and account for the fact that they can be provided not only by households, but also by the public and or private sectors through greater investment in social and physical infrastructure. As noted in earlier slides, it would also be important to measure the long-term effects of fiscal policies that prioritize care provision. The present slide sketches key characteristics of a more recent modeling approach developed to represent unpaid domestic work, and which aims to stress the role that investment in physical infrastructure can play in promoting, simultaneously, gender equality and economic growth. In a series of papers, Aganor and Canuto introduce a novel framework with a potential for addressing some of the limitations of earlier gender-aware models. Their approach involves differentiating between kinds of unpaid work and linking improvements in infrastructure that reduces the drudgery of housework to long-term health and productivity. This framework is developed within a computable, overlapping generations model aimed at assessing the impact of various gender-based policies on GDP growth. Women allocate their time between three alternatives, market work, raising children, and home production, by which the authors essentially mean unpaid housework. Men, on the other hand, allocate their time exclusively to market work. The model also assumes that fathers have a higher preference for current consumption whereas mothers have a higher preference for children's health. Home production combines women's time allocated to that activity, for instance, food preparation, with infrastructure services, for instance, electricity and labor-saving cooking devices. The underlying hypothesis is that if access to infrastructure improves, women can allocate more time to the care of their children, hence contributing to their better health and human capital accumulation in the long run. The assumption built into the model is that if mothers are not biased towards their boys and instead support their boys and girls equally, this is likely to improve women's bargaining power within their households in the next generation. This is because the model also assumes that women's bargaining power depends on the relative levels of human capital of husband and wife. This approach to the gender impact of infrastructure investment has been applied to Benin and Brazil. Other country applications are also being considered. Differentiating women's uses of time and linking these to health outcomes and productivity of the future labor force with a dynamic perspective is a very welcome feature of this modeling approach. Other aspects of the model would merit further refinement, however. In particular, the model makes strong assumptions about gender roles between spouses and across generations. It does not allow for any participation of men in the unpaid activities of childcare and housework. This rules out the possibility that any policy intervention or economic shock may encourage a more equal sharing of men and women in meeting their families' needs. Moreover, modeling women's bargaining power in the next generation solely as a function of their mother's propensity to invest in their health and education, while assuming that public spending in health and education would always be gender neutral, is somewhat problematic. Finally, these studies only focus on the effects of physical infrastructure investment and do not consider simulating investment to improve care provisioning such as investment in health and or childcare, 
The issue of investment in childcare, health, and education is addressed by yet another family of recent models to which we now turn. The debate on approaches to assessing the economic outcomes of investing in care-related services, also termed social infrastructure, among gender-aware economic scholars has become especially lively in the last few years. As shown in Figure 3, which is taken from a paper by Ipik Ilkarakan, economic returns to care investments take place through both supply and demand side channels. This map also vividly illustrates the many gendered interactions that can be triggered by a specific kind of social infrastructure spending. Up until recently, most studies and policy discussions focused on the labor supply side effects of access to care services. Their main argument is that for workers with care responsibilities who are predominantly women, access to care services alleviates the time constraints on their labor supply. This is likely to improve female labor force participation and can also contribute to improving the productivity of workers with care responsibilities. Another supply-side channel regards the critical role that expanding services, such as childcare and preschool services, play in the social and mental development of children with potential long-run growth-enhancing effects through improved quality of human capital. A number of more recent studies approaches the issue from a demand-side perspective and within a macroeconomic framework. They focus on job generation directly in the care sectors, as well as indirectly in other sectors through backward linkages. Care services expansion creates new jobs, mostly in female-dominated occupations and sectors. And as such, their argument goes, it promotes gender equality and also through the labor demand side. In sum, this useful diagram demonstrates that expansion of care services can facilitate the narrowing of gender economic gaps through a double-pronged mechanism that becomes operational both on the supply side and the demand side. It alleviates the time constraints on women's labor and improves female labor force participation while simultaneously creating jobs in female-dominated sectors and generating demand for women's labor. This, in turn, can potentially contribute to reduce gender gaps in employment and wages, and hence to reduce the risk of poverty. The important implication of all of this is that expansion of care services thus creates many good synergies contributing to both gender equality and economic development if policies are well designed. CGE models would be particularly suited to represent all the channels shown in this diagram. Many of the recent demand-side studies on investing in care services use methodologies closely related to CGE analysis, such as input-output analysis and micro-simulation exercises. The next slide provides further detail. These demand studies on investment in care, most notably the work by Ipik Karakan and other colleagues at the Levy Economics Institute of Bard College, share similar research frameworks, but vary in methodologies care sectors in which they focus, and measures for assessing economic returns. The matrix excerpt in this slide, taken from the ELO guide, lists a selected sample of these studies and shows that they simulate mainly an expansion of early child education and care, but in some cases also health and long-term care. They mostly use input-output analysis combined with micro-simulation exercises but a few of them build fully developed social accounting matrices and CGE frameworks. A detailed description of these models is beyond the scope of this session, but you are encouraged to use the references provided in your reading list if you wish to find out more. The most important point to note here is that the main reason these studies focus on short-term demand side effects is based on the objective of addressing fiscal policy design and its implications for inclusive growth and gender equality, which are particularly important in the context of the current COVID-19 economic crisis.
Their main findings show that, given the substantially higher labor intensity and female intensity of care work, each dollar spent on the care sector has the potential to generate two or three times more jobs than if the same dollar was to be spent on other sectors, such as physical infrastructure and construction. The higher jobs generation improves wage earnings, reduces gender gaps in both employment and wages, and can even generate higher tax revenues through taxes from new jobs and income creation. These studies demonstrate that an increase in public spending on care services is not only good for gender equality, but would also be partly self-financed. This potential for self-financing in the short run is especially important from a policymaker's perspective given the concerns that increased public investments require fiscal space, which is often constrained in many developing countries and has become even more binding in the context of the COVID pandemic. This last slide summarizes the main learning points in this session. We explained why a gender lens is important for the understanding of how economies work. We described the key ingredients that a CGE model should have to enable gender-aware distributional analysis. We reviewed a range of approaches that can be used to integrate gender features into social accounting matrices and CGE models. And we showed how to use a CGE framework to formulate questions that can help in exploring policy options for the promotion of gender equality. Finally, we also stressed throughout the whole session that building a gender-aware model is much more than merely disaggregating variables by sex. We hope you found the module useful and that you will feel stimulated to experiment with these kinds of themes and research methodologies in your future work.